when you start to meditate, it's important that you make a firm determination. Establish the firm intention that you're going to stay with the breath for the entire hour. And it's good to remind yourself of the reasons for why you want to do this, because that's, that helps to firm up the intention. We're here because we want a happiness that's blameless, a happiness that's dependable, a happiness that will last. And this is the road that leads there, training the mind. The Buddha once said this is the difference between a, a wise person and a foolish person. The foolish person sees no need to train the mind. Happiness can be bought, happiness can be taken. That's the foolish person's attitude. But the wise person sees that that kind of happiness is not dependable. Because it requires that conditions be a certain way. Conditions that lie totally outside your control. The fact that those conditions are unstable means that the happiness that comes from them is going to be unstable as well. So reflect on that. Sometimes you hear theories about how causality works in life. And it's typical in many philosophies and religions that causality starts with the unmoved mover, something permanent, something good that gives rise to everything we experience. The question, of course, is why is, why is it that a permanent cause would lead to changeable results? Or a good cause would lead rise to undesirable results. And it offers no help at all. If something is undesirable, where do you go back and change the cause to make it more desirable? Because if the cause doesn't change, you're stymied. But as the Buddha saw, causes change too. And effects can have an effect on causes. It's one of the reasons why things are so unstable and reliable, but it's also part of the way out. The causes of suffering can be changed. That means that you actually can put an end to suffering. The Buddha's approach is not to simply accept suffering as a given in life. That has to be that way, and we simply learn how to accept it, and that's the end of the problem. He saw that suffering could actually be brought to an end. And the causes of suffering are largely internal, which means that the way to put an end to suffering is largely an internal job as well. Someone once said true happiness is an inside job. That's why we train the mind, is to search for those causes that are leading to suffering and see that we can change them. So keep this point in mind as you practice, because it's a common experience. You sit here focused on the breath, and then after a while you realize you haven't been on the breath at all. You've been someplace else. There's a lapse of mindfulness, a lapse of alertness. And we're usually surprised that it's happened, but we shouldn't be. Expect that the mind will come up with alternative intentions in the course of the hour, and you want to be on the lookout for them. So while you're focused on the breath, you also have to be heedful of the fact that you might lose the breath at any time. So you want to do your best to strengthen your, your focus, strengthen your mindfulness, strengthen your alertness. And one way to do that is, as soon as you catch yourself wandering off, immediately come back to the breath. Don't engage in recrimination. Don't berate yourself for losing the breath. 
because that will probably tie you up in another long discourse that takes you away from the breath again. Just come back to the breath as quickly as possible, reestablish yourself, and try to get interested in the breath. As the Buddha said, that using your powers of analysis is one way of actually leading the mind into concentration. So for people who don't find simply calming the mind by being with the breath enough, you can look into the breath as a process to explore. How does the breathing affect the body? How does the effect of the breath on the body have an effect on the mind? How can you maximize the positive effects? What kind of breathing would feel really good? And when it feels good, what can you do with that good feeling? The Buddha suggests spreading it around, allowing it to permeate throughout the body. So there's plenty to do here. It's not just in, out, in, out, in, out. While the breath comes in, you want to explore how it's coming in, how it has an effect on different parts of the body. When it goes out, what's the most comfortable way of allowing it to go out? All too often our cartoon notion of the breath coming in, the breath going out requires that we squeeze it out when it goes out, but you don't want to do that. The squeezing is actually limiting the breath energy in the body. You might just tell yourself, you'll help the breath come in, but when it goes out, it can go out on its own. You don't have to push it, you don't have to squeeze it. That way you find you can begin to maintain a sense of fullness in the in breath and even through the out breath. When you breathe with that sense of fullness, the breath becomes a lot more interesting, feels a lot better. And you begin to realize that this breath work we do in the body is an important way of getting the mind interested in the breath, so that you don't have to force it to stay here. The power of your curiosity keeps you here. At the same time, you have to keep an eye on the breath, an eye on the mind, to notice when it's beginning to show the signs it's going to wander off. Make be a little impatient. The results aren't coming as fast as you'd like. Nothing seems to be changing. And the mind starts looking for someplace else to go, something else to think about. And if you're really alert, you can catch it before a distracting thought is fully formed. The more quickly you can see that, the better. You can feel that stirring in the body of a form of the thought beginning to occur. It's a, like a little tingling or a little stirring around. And at that point it's hard to say whether it's physical or mental. It could be either. There will come a point then when the mind decides that it's a potential for a thought and it looks into it and it turns it into a thought, thought world. The more quickly you can see that, you can begin to zap it at the very beginning of the stirring. This too is something you'll find in the breath. So even though we say keep one eye on the breath and the other eye on the potential for the mind to leave, when you really look carefully at the breath you'll find that the potential for it to leave is right there as well. So you don't have to split your focus. So in this way you can help maintain that original intention to stay continually with the breath. Because it's interesting. Because there's lots of things to learn. A similar principle applies when you leave meditation. Because you really don't want to leave totally. You spent all this time getting the mind to settle down. It'd be a shame to just throw it away. So there's a skill to leaving meditation as well, a skill to opening your eyes. When you open your eyes, remind yourself that the breath body is still here, the sense of energy in the body is still here. All too often when we open our eyes, all our attention goes out into the visual world, and our sense of the body gets shrunk, gets blotted out. 
and you want to learn how not to do that. In other words, you can be aware of the visual world at the same time that you're aware of the breath energy world. You might ask yourself, which contains which? Does your sense of the body contain your awareness of the visual world, or does the visual world contain your sense of the body? See which way of conceiving it helps you to maintain that sense of breath awareness, even as you open your eyes, get up, move around, negotiate the outside world. Since your breath awareness becomes more continuous, you learn things this way as well. You learn how to maintain a sense of ease, even in difficult situations, a sense of fullness times when your mind would normally be daydreaming or drifting around. It doesn't have to. It can stay right here and continue to explore the sense of the body. And you begin to sense easily which things knock you off balance, which distract you, pull you out of the body. When you see that happening, you realize you've got found an issue. This is how concentration leads to insight. It provides you with a still center from which you can watch the movements of the mind and see where they go. So you can detect, oh, this is what a defilement is like. This blocks the mind. It obscures the mind. You check into it as a greed, anger, delusion, lust, fear, jealousy. What are the things that's, excuse me, that spark these emotions? You see the defilements in real time. If you're able to do this, then the next time you sit down, it's going to be a lot easier to stay with the breath more continually. If you build up the habit of throwing away your concentration as soon as you get up, it's going to be a lot easier to throw it away in the midst of your meditation. you got to keep in mind that fact. The mind has to be trained if you want to gain true happiness. And you don't train the mind only when you sit here with your eyes closed. You want the training to be 24-7, because the mind's potential to create problems is 24-7 as well. So it's a matter of establishing your priorities. What kind of happiness do you want? What other things are you willing to give up? How much time and energy are you planning to invest, willing to invest, to find true happiness? This is another aspect of wisdom, is keeping your priorities clear. If true happiness is the top priority, that helps to pull the mind out of its ignorance. In other words, it's concerned for other issues. And bring the issue of suffering and its causes up to the forefront. Because that's what clear knowing is all about, is having clear priorities, that the issue of suffering is paramount. This is the most important issue you want to deal with. Because when the Buddha talks about ignorance, it's not just a general lack of knowledge about things. You can know many things and still be ignorant of the big issue. And part of that ignorance comes from the fact that you don't really regard it as the big issue. You've got other priorities, other agendas. But the Buddha wants you to see that the question of suffering is the big issue in life. And your ability to train yourself to put an end to it, that should be your top priority. When I was up in Bellingham this last weekend, I was out walking after the meal. This guy looked at me and he said, Buddhist? I said, yeah. He said, why are there so many religions in the world? I said, it's because the different religions ask different questions. So what's the Buddhist question? The Buddhist question is, why are we suffering and what can we do to put an end to it? Don't you just hate that question, he said. I said, no, I think it's a pretty good question. 
In fact, that there is suffering is something that you might not like, and it's natural not to like it. But it would be strange to hate the question of asking why it happens and how you can put an end to it. We should regard it. This is the most important question. It's a privilege we have to be able to question this. and to find an answer. And one of the duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths is to develop the path. That's what we're doing here right now. So wisdom, knowledge, is largely a matter of priorities. As you're sitting here, your top priority should be to stay with the breath, to develop your powers of mindfulness and concentration, discernment. And a lot of the practice is learning how to stick to those priorities, not let other priorities sneak in. <laughs>